It's about history, policy, and impact. A new perspective on current affairs, bringing experience, insight, civility, and scholarship to the urgent issues of today. It's about our past, present, and future. Your host, Pulitzer Prize winning author and journalist, Douglas Blackman. From the University of Virginia's Miller Center, this is American Forum. Welcome back. I'm Doug Blackman. Our goal on American Forum is to gather at this table national leaders, decision makers, the greatest minds of our country. Some of them are famous, others are emerging thinkers you might not yet know about, but should. Our guest today is one of those new thinkers you need to know. Kevin Cruz is a brilliant young historian at Princeton University who is pushing the boundaries of how Americans understand ourselves, our history, and what we've been taught was a bedrock of our national values. He's the author of a new book asserting that the concept of a Christian America comes not from the founding of the Republic, but is a product of much more recent times and deeply influenced by corporate America. Kevin, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. So your book, the subtitle in particular, makes a pretty big claim uh, that, mm -hmm. that Christian America is a creation of corporate America. What about the Puritans and uh, you know, Catholics in Maryland? The narratives that we know so well that, that our religious principles and our connectivity to that really go deeply back to the very beginnings of the American psyche. Uh, if you look at what happened with the founding of this country, the founders were quite clear. Uh, Americans today will look back to the Declaration of Independence and it's, uh, it's notation that uh, uh, the Creator endowed us with certain rights. Certainly, that's true. Uh, but if you look at the Constitution itself, the only references to religion in the Constitution are ones that keep the state and the church uh, farly apart. Uh, so there's no religious oaths for office holders. Uh, there is no establishment of a national religion. There, uh, Congress is forbidden from interfering with the free exercise of religion. The book was originally going to be um, a grassroots study of religious conservatism in the 60s and 70s, kind of a prehistory to the moral majority was how I was looking at that. Uh, and so as I began to research that, uh, the, the traditional story of the religious right is the first thing that gets uh, religious conservatives angry is the Supreme Court decision in 1962 striking down um, state mandated um, school prayer. So I thought I'd look at that issue to begin with. And so I went down to uh, the Library of Congress, uh, up to the Library of Congress from here, uh, and uh, looked at the papers of Hugo Black who wrote that decision. And there are 10 giant boxes of letters and telegrams that Hugo Black received in response to this decision. I was excited to find those. I was Stunned by what I found in them, though. There were hundreds, if not thousands, of letters in there that made reference to, well, aren't we one nation under God? Isn't our motto, in God we trust? Things that had happened just not even a decade before were being invoked by Americans as a sign that this Supreme Court justice had gotten the First Amendment wrong uh, and, that, and that these things trumped the, the First Amendment. Uh, this went against everything I'd ever been told. I'd always uh, been told that, that uh, those things, in God we trust, one nation under God, were, uh, in the words of... Uh, Yale Law School Dean Eugene Rostow in 1962, ceremonial deism. And it's a great phrase. Deism, again, the founders believed in God. Many of them were deists. Uh, the language is always divorced from a specific sect. It's always one nation under God, not one nation under Jesus Christ. But the ceremonial part was the really important part because Rostow said things like one nation under God and in God we trust, they're constitutional because they're purely ornamental. There's no substance to them. They're just something that we do uh, in our rituals. There, there's no real meaning to them. You can't have a complaint against them. In fact, he said they're uncontroversial, so they're constitutional. Um, but what I found in this uh, stack of letters sent to Hugo Black was that for ordinary Americans, those phrases had real meaning. They were ceremonial, but ceremonies are important. Uh, you know, ceremonies are what we live by. Uh, and so uh, I, I realized I had to move the book back. And so I moved back to look at the creation of these phrases in the 50s as I dug into that. Uh, I found another thread that took me back to the 30s and this origin of this, uh, this corporate resistance that, that I say got this whole thing rolling. But so what was it that happened in the 30s that begins to be the basis of corporate America inventing Christian America? Uh, it's the New Deal, uh, and it's businesses' reaction to the New Deal. Um, uh, with the rise of uh, Franklin Roosevelt's government in 33 and 34, uh, business feels like it's under attack and from two directions. Washington, D.C. is now issuing uh, regulations on the economy like it had never before to this degree. But also, it's empowered labor unions. So their own workers are, from, are striking from within. The government is coming after them uh, uh, from, from above as they see this. And so they look for a way to, to fight back. And so uh, business leaders and groups like the US Chamber of Commerce, the National Association of Manufacturers, uh, 
new groups they found, like the American Liberty League, uh, they undertake a massive public relations campaign. Uh, their enemy is called a propaganda campaign, uh, in which they try to convince the public that the solution to the depression lies with big business. All we have to do is get the government out of business's way. Uh, unfettered free enterprise will save the day. Uh, the problem is, is that in the wake of the crash, the public isn't buying this. Uh, and no matter how much they spend, and they spend, the National Association of Manufacturers increases its PR campaign uh, about 22 times over. They're spending about half of their budget on this, uh, uh, on this project. Uh, and no one's, no one's listening. And so they say, okay, well, we need to rethink our campaign. How are we going to convince people business is the way? Well, they look at the polls. Who's the most trusted person in America? A minister is. And they say this quite explicitly. We need to get ministers to make the case. So let's make a case that free enterprise goes hand in hand with political freedom and religious freedom, and you can't have any of those without all three together. And who's the central character in that? A minister named uh, Reverend James uh, W. Fifield. Uh, he's the pastor of First Congregational Church in Los Angeles, which is a church, uh, his pews are literally filled with millionaires. Uh, uh, the, the mayor attends, the publisher of the LA Times, Cecil B. DeMille. Uh, and he preaches a message uh, that they like to hear, which is that uh, uh, the New Deal is evil. Uh, it is a form, he says, of pagan statism. And instead, what we need is a return to, again, this kind of unfettered free enterprise. Uh, he links Christianity and capitalism. He sees that, that, that they're, uh, they're deeply intertwined. In his view, both are systems that stress individualism above all else. So as he tells it, Christianity is a system in which if you're good, you go to heaven. If you're bad, you go to hell. Capitalism is the same way, he says. If you're good, you make a profit. If you're bad, you go to the poorhouse. And any system that interferes with that divinely prescribed order of things, he says, is a form of pagan statism and is itself evil. And so that idea then begins to take hold? Or, you mean, how, how does it metastasize? He forms this group in 1935 called Spiritual Mobilization. And he gets the, uh, the backing first of very wealthy men in his congregation. I mean, they link him up with national leaders. So the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, National Association of Manufacturers, uh, individual corporate leaders like the heads of, uh, of Sun Oil, uh, General Motors, Republic Steel, U.S. Steel, uh, J.C. Penney, uh, Maytag, on and on. Uh, they start funding this group called Spiritual Mobilization. Uh, and that group gets the message out. Uh, and it's a message uh, that its opponents uh, wind up calling Christian libertarianism. Uh, but uh, Fifield boils it down to a simple kind of almost bumper sticker-like slogan of freedom under God as opposed to the slavery of the state. And so they popularize this message uh, uh, through uh, a monthly magazine, through a weekly radio program, through these uh, fantastic uh, major events, including a, uh, a 1951 uh, Fourth of July spe special with you know, Bing Crosby as the host, and uh, Lionel Barrymore does a reading of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, so they're very effective at using this massive amount of corporate funding behind this message uh, to get it out. It's wholly political. Uh, that group, the American Liberty League, is, is one of the most famous ones in the 30s. And they're deeply funded by General Motors and DuPont. The problem is that that message comes across as it's from General Motors and DuPont. Uh, Jim Farley, the head of the Democratic Party, has a great line that uh, the American Liberty League, they ought to call it the American Cellophane League, because number one, it's a DuPont product, and number two, you can see right through them. Is there like the memo that says, hey, the other way is not working, we need to come up with, a, we need to redefine religion in America? Yeah, yeah, it, it's in their, their private documents, but also even their public speeches. Uh, uh, the head of a National Association of Manufacturers in 1940, basically he gets the job when he makes a, a famous speech in 1939 to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and he says quite explicitly, economic arguments are not working. We're still in public disfavor. What we need to do is play up to uh, the American people's uh, sense of uh, patriotism and piety. And if we do that, then business will be restored. And so they're very open about this. And again, you know, in their private letters, they say, well, who, who can we trust? The polls show ministers. Let's get a minister. And this is what leads to the, uh, the addition of In God We Trust to the Pledge of Allegiance in 1954. It's in 49 uh, that this freedom under God message starts to get spread through uh, the magazines and the, and, the, and the radio program. And 1951 is that massive freedom under God uh, ceremony where they've got this radio program. They've got 17,000 ministers across the country engaged in a sermon contest. They're competing for cash prizes to create uh, sermons on this theme of freedom under God and the evils of, of the New Deal state. Um, and this message gets out there uh, broadly in 51, and the movement to add under God to the pledge starts just a few months thereafter, after this, this has been blanketing the airwaves. When the American people are hearing that, that this needs to be done, this is important to add these words, uh, these reassuring words for many Americans, what are they being told is the real reason? Well, the story of the public, and this is the story that historians had bought largely, was that this is all about communism. 
this is all about um, uh, the Soviet Union. So the traditional story is, as the Soviet Union discovers the bomb, uh, America rediscovers God. And so all of these uh, religious trappings that happen in this quick span of time in the early 50s, not just un one nation under God and a God we trust, but the national prayer breakfast, uh, uh, prayers before cabinet meetings, on and on. That all these things happen simply as a, a reaction to what the Soviet Union is doing. Uh, and there's, there's something to that. I think, I think that, that Cold War climate is important. Uh, but what I found in the research is, is tracing back the public speeches and the private writings of the men behind this, uh, is that that language um, uh, had been in the works for 20 years. Uh, and they, they had been fighting communism, uh, but they saw the communism uh, that was the dearest threat to them uh, coming not from Moscow, but from Washington, D.C. Uh, they always see the New Deal as uh, what they call creeping socialism. So it's really an extension of this international communist menace. Uh, and it's, it's only in the 50s with Dwight Eisenhower in, in the White House, an enthusiastic supporter, that this finally catches fire and, and becomes a, a national phenomenon. And that's the point at which the story begins to be carried by, by figures we are for, more familiar with, like Ike and Billy Graham. Well, we don't think of him this way, but Billy Graham really was a, a member of this Christian libertarian movement, especially in his early years. Uh, his early crusades, uh, he comes to attention, first of all, because he has the backing of, of some of the richest men in America, the richest man in America, in fact. Sid Richardson, an oil man, uh, is one of his big patrons. Henry Luce at Time Life, William Randolph Hearst, uh, uh, these conservative publishers give him attention. And they do so because he's preaching this message of Christian libertarianism, that uh, basically uh, uh, God favors uh, free enterprise above all else. Uh, and on the, during his crusades in the early 50s, he's outspoken. Uh, both in defense of, uh, of business leaders, but also on the attack against labor unions. Uh, he tells the Greensboro, North Carolina crusade in 1952 that the Garden of Eden is a paradise where there will be uh, no union dues, no labor leaders, no snakes, and no disease. Uh, he says, the kind of revival I'm calling for, he tells a Boston crowd, is a revival that'll have the worker put in an honest eight hours work. He says, no good Christian would ever strike against his employer. And those employers, he says, are the really uh, uh, true Christians. Does that suggest that someone like Billy Graham was insincere? I think on this, his faith was, his faith is sincere, but I think he sees the political ends to which it could be used. It kind of sets up the American people as suckers too, doesn't it? I don't think so. I, I think what happens here that's important is the pivot that Eisenhower makes. And after he gets elected, he makes a, an appearance to the Freedoms Foundation where he utters this famous quote. He says, our form of government makes no sense unless it's founded on a deeply felt religious faith, and I don't care what it is. And his opponents mock him for that. Uh, William Lee Miller at Yale uh, Divinity School says, oh, apparently Eisenhower is a very fervent believer in a very vague religion. But that was Eisenhower's point. He knew that religion could only unite the American people if it was uh, vaguely drawn. Uh, you, you can't you know, advance the principles if you're a Baptist to enforce that on the country or if you're a Catholic, force Catholicism on it. And so it's this vaguely drawn, again, this ceremonial deism. Uh, and what Eisenhower does is he takes this language of the Christian libertarians, uh, freedom under God, uh, and he actually drops away the partisan origins and he makes it a language that can apply to anybody. So this movement that had previously been one of uh, uh, conservative Protestants, becomes one in Eisenhower's hand that welcomes in uh, Democrats as well as Republicans, welcomes in Catholics and Jews, uh, as well as Protestants, uh, liberals and conservatives alike. And the American people aren't suckers. As Eisenhower sells it, it is something that can bring them together in this broad, vague national sense. Atheists and agnostics are left outside, uh, but a very pretty small number at this point. And said anyone who has a general belief in God can come together under this umbrella. And so it does work for at least a short time. And that's the beginning also of the, the great ecumenical period of, right. of American life, where you get into the 50s and the 60s and the National Council of Churches, mm -hmm. in which lots of different denominations are actually working together, some of them even on the correct side of civil rights. And there's a lot of talk in a lot of denominations about being less conscious of the mm -hmm. divisions between different right. faiths. I mean, there is a big movement uh, along those lines. Um, I, I used to joke that, that the American people just, um, that we misspell God's name, that we, it's supposed to have two O's in it, and we, we just believe in good, um, uh, and, the, and, and, and maybe that's what the founders meant, the sense of the creator, some sort of good mm -hmm. with it, it's got a force behind it, um, mm -hmm. and the creator. It, but the, that doesn't sound so cynical, though, what, what, what you just described Eisenhower doing sounds like adapting this to what the, what the founding documents say. 
Yeah, I think, I think, and I, I think Eisenhower is sincere in this. Um, uh, he wants, he believes that this is going to be something that's going to unite people, and believes that this broad religion is going to be good to unite the American people. Sounds like me. I'm a, I'm a very lapsed Presbyterian, um, uh, but I come from a bunch of fundamentalist primitive Baptists, and I'm a really lapsed primitive Baptist. Uh, <laughs> An evolved primitive Baptist. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, you know, another more conventional historian's narrative around some of this is that, that yes, all these things happened, obviously, that mm -hmm. you're talking about, but that the really powerful origins of the current day religious right and the, the intensity of Christian America and today's national discourse, that that's really more something that happens uh, in response to the, to the cultural turmoil of the 60s and the mm -hmm. 70s, or, or perhaps alternatively or with it, it's a response to the civil rights movement mm -hmm. and, uh, or the uh, abortion ruling in the early 1970s, and that, and, and that really what we think of now in terms of, of, uh, of religious political activism mm -hmm is more rooted in that period of time and a response to those, those big changes in American life. Uh, I would agree with that completely. Again, this project started out as an exploration of the religious right forming at the grassroots in the 60s and 70s. Uh, but again, what led me to this was the realization that these phrases have power. So what, the story here is not that corporate America created the modern religious right, but rather that they set up um, a series of religious and, and patriotic uh, symbols, mottos, ceremonies that later become a touchstone for the religious right. So again, if you look at, as I did in the, in the school prayer thing, and as I also did on, on Roe v. Wade, uh, the letters being written in that are angry, uh, they constantly invoke these phrases. I, they do today. Uh, you, you'll, you'll see this in the presidential campaign, invocations of one nation under God and God we trust to advance a kind of social conservative uh, vision of the religious right. Uh, uh, so this is really a story of unintended consequences. This movement for economic and political conservatism spawns uh, this kind of social religious conservatism. And I was interested in this uh, to see the way in which these, these different faiths come together. That was an education for me, too. Uh, as a Catholic, for me, it was interesting to see the way in which Catholics glom onto what is a, originally a Protestant movement uh, and very much one that's, that has Protestant edges in that, that early Christian libertarian uh, phase. Once Eisenhower kind of opens the gates and welcomes everyone in, the Catholics rush in to take advantage of this. The, the, the sponsor of, uh, of the, 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 the pledge change uh, is a Catholic congressman. He gets a note from the Knights of Columbus who are very proud about their role in proposing this. Uh, they start doing that in 52. Um, and so Catholics, I think, see this as a way, to, again, to prove their Americanism. So, so it's not just that, again, this question of, of were people suckers. I think people at the grassroots saw this as an opportunity to prove their Americanism, that we are one nation under God, and that means Catholics too. That means Protestants too. That means Jews too. There, there are references to Buddhists. Uh, to, to Muslims, to Hindus as well in this, in this era, uh, as small as their, their, their portions were. Uh, but there's a real sense here of the, of the face coming together, and so there are ready uh, 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 participants of this ac across the board. Well, and it makes sense that this is also the way that we go from, in a fairly short period of time, this would be a very positive dimension of all this, maybe it's all positive, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't want to say otherwise, the, but we go from a period where in the 1920s, just before your primary narrative, um, Catholics are viewed with great suspicion by right. like my folks, mm -hmm. you know, my people, right. you know, we're very much anti-papists. Mm -hmm. um, the peak of the Klan is, is as much about uh, Jews and Catholics in many parts of the country right. is about African Americans. And so we go in from a very brief period of time from where these, at the ground, uh, at the grassroots level, the religious divisions are really profound mm -hmm. uh, into this era where now, you know, it's hard for me to explain to my kids what the difference is between a Protestant and a Catholic. Right. There's this period in the 50s where all these groups come together and they embrace this, again, because it's kept at this very vague, very broad level, this, this level of ceremonial deism. And so Protestants, Catholics, and Jews come together to support mottos like one nation under God and God we trust. The problem comes when this filters down to the local level because at the, at the national level you can invoke these vague, vague mottos. If you're doing Bible reading in the public school, you've got to pick a Bible. Do you pick the one that the Protestants use, the one the Catholics use, the ones that your Jewish students use? When the fight over school prayer develops, that it's, one would assume it's a fight between really religious people and atheists, but in fact it's not. It's a, it's a dispute between very religious people, and it really is a freedom, a freedom of faith within this broad spectrum of faith. That's right, yeah. So there's this moment I talk about here after the school prayer decision. Uh, Congress um, uh, comes very close to passing uh, a constitutional amendment to allow school prayer. Uh, it's incredibly popular. Uh, in the 1963-64 term, uh, when Congress is debating the Civil Rights Act of 64, the school prayer amendment actually gets the most mail. It gets 50% of Congress's mail in this period. And, and the support is overwhelmingly in favor of this. And it seems like it's going to 
pass with no problem at all. And what happens is uh, civil liberties groups start to realize this is, this is going to go through, and they start to mobilize uh, moderate and liberal religious leaders. And they speak out very effectively against this. And they do, from that, uh, that perspective you noted, uh, that this isn't one of, of uh, they're opposed to this because they're taking a secularist viewpoint. Rather, they don't want the state to intrude, to, to, they don't want the state to intrude on uh, their religious uh, turf. Uh, they don't want the state to take over religious instruction. They don't want the take, state to take over uh, religion in general. Uh, but they take it seriously. And they, these kind of phrases of one nation under God, their value that had been in uh, keeping things kind of vague and broadly drawn, well, if you're a Baptist, you don't want vague and broadly drawn. You want Baptists. If you're a Catholic, you want Catholic teachings. You don't want this kind of watered-down faith, what I call in the book a, a lowest common denomination uh, faith. Uh, you want something that's very specific and, and dear to your own. You, have the you don't of, want the church of good. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. You don't, you don't want these kind of... And, 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 it, and it wasn't just liberals who objected to this. When this, the school prayer, uh, uh, the New York Regents uh, case comes up, uh, fundamentalists hate the prayer in question because it doesn't mention Jesus Christ. And if you're a fundamentalist and it doesn't mention Jesus Christ, you say it's a pagan prayer. Uh, this, this far right group says it would have risen no higher than the ceiling of the classroom. Right? So they want actual prayer, not this kind of watered down uh, replication that isn't going to supplant their faith. They're worried it's going it's to it's take it over. Uh, and that's, that's a real problem for them. But is it also, is that a story of how, in some respects, the people who started this whole process then lost control of it? Because today, uh, you have that the, the, the people who are the conservatives, who are most concerned about the state of the Republican Party, the, sort of the conventional conservatives like a Dwight Eisenhower, mm -hmm. uh, I think would be a bit horrified by uh, many dimensions of what has happened in, with conservative politics in, in America today. And the folks they probably would be most worried about are the ones like Ted Cruz mm -hmm. in the current campaign, uh, who are invoking some of this, some of these um, uh, of these ideas and images more strongly than any other. Oh, I think they absolutely lost control. Uh, I, I think uh, first the Christian libertarians lost control as it became this touchstone for social conservatism, not uh, the economic conservatism they'd originally planned. Uh, Eisenhower would have been. Uh, a, a little horrified to see this language that he had always used to bring Americans together, uh, really starting with Nixon, starts to drive them apart. But Nixon uh, really uh, takes a kind of a partisan edge to this. Uh, so so it's, it's certainly changed now. Uh, I don't think, they, you know, Eisenhower wouldn't be upset with the invocations of faith. I think he would be uh, a little concerned with the ends to which it's been used. And what about the, the, the case of... Um of Kim Davis, the county clerk in Grayson, Kentucky, who's been refusing to issue mm -hmm. uh, marriage licenses to gay couples. The, the, is, is that a, it, it seems to me that a Dwight Eisenhower, while he might have objected to the gay marriage part uh, mm -hmm. conceptually, but that once it had been uh, the law of the land, that his, his view would be that in this ecumenical sense that that becomes part of the, the, the shared views of, of, of the nation, and it's the duty of an, of an officer of the state to, to fulfill the law. Eisenhower had a clear sense of his duty. And again, you only have to look at the, the reaction of Brown versus Board, a different Supreme Court case, uh, in which many segregationists uh, invoked the Bible as the reason that, uh, that the court had erred and that they were going to obey uh, the authority of God on this. They invoked you know, the curse of Ham uh, to justify segregation. Uh, and uh, someone like Eisenhower would have no truck with that. Uh, again, he sent the, uh, the Airborne into, into Little Rock to, uh, to enforce the order there. He would have had no patience for certainly a, a government official uh, refusing to obey the law. When, the, when this um, plan, in effect, was mm -hmm. put in place, and that ultimately the folks who triggered this change in American life, when they did lose control of this, is this also a narrative of that what was fundamentally and, and genuinely at the founding, uh, a, what was a bedrock view, that there is a creator of some sort, mm -hmm. there is a shared sense of the human spirit, the value of the human being, and that that's something that can be acknowledged and broadly accepted by Americans. Was what, it, the story that you tell, is it one in which those ideas are actually twisted in a way that ultimately, once lost control of, become kind of a dangerous element of American life? I don't think they have to be dangerous. I mean, I, I think there is still power in those phrases to, to bring Americans together. And you don't need to look to, to the distance, distant past. I mean, you know, the, the administration of George W. Bush after 9-11, uh, he was the first president to make a visit to a mosque. He made clear that Muslims were part of this expansive religious community. So there, there can be a, a positive side to this. The danger is, you know, what happens with the increasing numbers of non-believers or, or the, the non-affiliates uh, out there, and, and how are they uh, reacting to this too? So there's a there's a delicate balance there, and so President Obama talked about 
a nation of believers and unbelievers, which was, I think, an important first. And how you uh, balance between those groups is, uh, is, is something that the politicians will have to sort out. Kevin Cruz, thanks for a provocative and, and, uh, and convincing book. Thank you very much. The book is One Nation Under God, How Corporate America Invented Christian America. We invite you to join the conversation with American Forum and our guests on Twitter or Facebook. For transcripts and podcasts, visit us at millercenter.org American Forum, where this program is available 24 hours a day. I'm Doug Blackman. See you next week.